next we will see the interrupt process like when an interrupt occurs then how this that interrupt is serviced in 8085 both the non vectored interrupt and the vectored interrupt. So, we will first look into the non vectored interrupt. The non vectored interrupt process is like this first of all the process uh, should be enabled using the enable interrupt instruction. So, if this enable interrupt is not executed uh, by uh, the processor then the processor will not be able to receive any of the interrupts. In fact, when the processor is reset this enable interrupt this is uh, the all the interrupts are enabled and for the purpose of uh, different programs. So, it may so happen that the, the, the interrupts have been disabled through the DI instruction. So, uh, if this EI is not done then uh, this interrupt will not reach the processor. So, the first thing to ensure is that the uh, interrupts are enabled using the EI instruction. Now, as we know that interrupt can occur at any point of time during execution of uh, instructions by the processor. So, what the processor does is irrespective of the point at which the interrupt has occurred. So, interrupt will be checked uh, whether the processor will check for the interrupt at the end of every instruction. So, typically the in the last machine cycle the interrupt uh, is uh, the, the interrupts are checked whether, whether any interrupt has occurred or not. So, uh, we will see after uh, after a few lectures that how to decide like for how much time this interrupt pin should be activated to get an interrupt. So, uh, we can understand that the interrupt should be activated for at least a complete duration of one instruction. So, if we look into the instruction set whatever will be the largest uh, instruction execution time. So, the interrupt must be uh, enabled for that much of time to get the interrupt uh, detected. So, if the interrupt occurs then the what the uh, system does the microprocessor will first complete executing the current instruction. So, this is very important thing to note it is not that interrupt has occurred and the processor will leave the execution in the middle of uh, instruction middle of an instruction and go to the instruction interrupt service routine it does not happen like that. The first thing is it does is the interrupt uh, the, instru the current instruction that the processor is executing is completed. And once the instruction is completed then it will start a restart sequence how that interrupt service routine can be started. So, that is the restart sequence. So, first of all this restart sequence will reset the interrupt flip flop this is the first thing that is done. So, the, the interrupt enable flip flop that we have seen so that will be deactivated at the beginning of this uh, restart operation and it activates the interrupt acknowledge signal. So, this non vectored interrupt in 8085 INTR is the non vectored interrupt line. So, when that interrupt is detected the processor will first reset uh, the interrupt acknowledge uh, interrupt flip flop and then it will activate the interrupt acknowledge signal INTA. As we know that INTA is an active low signal. So, uh, this will be made low to make it active. Now, the protocol is like this that interrupt acknowledge uh, line should be connected somehow to the device which has generated the interrupt and on getting this interrupt acknowledgement the device should provide uh, some address from which the interrupt service routine has been located in the memory. Now, as a system designer we will know like in which uh, at what memory location the interrupt service routine for a particular device has been loaded. So, the um, ISR address should be provided by the device and how is it provided? It is provided by means of some RST instruction. So, there are 8 RST instructions and any of these um, a, so um, the, a, 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 each of these RST instruction is of the format RST n where n is a 3 bit number and then this RST n is a single byte instruction. So, what happens is that upon getting this interrupt the processor enters into an interrupt acknowledge machine cycle. In this interrupt acknowledge machine cycle this interrupt acknowledge pin is um, made low and it is expected that on the data bus the opcode for one of the RST n instructions will be available. And upon getting that particular opcode so processor will decide to which address it should go and accordingly it will go to the corresponding address. So, when the processor executes this RST instruction received from the device it saves the address of the next instruction in the stack. 
So this is the now it is the execution of the RST instruction. So upon getting the RST instruction, the first thing is that it will be saving the return address into the stack. So return address is saved into the stack, and it uh, the processor will jump to the appropriate interrupt uh, appropriate entry in the interrupt vector table. And this IVT entry, so it has to uh, redirect the processor to the actual service routine. So uh, as I said that each of this interrupt vector table uh, the location like each is, uh, so eight such locations will constitute to one of these RST codes and whatever be the value based on that it will reach a particular uh, location in the memory in the uh, page 0 to FF in that page it will uh, reach that particular location and uh, then it will it will start executing from that point. So, if your interrupt vector uh, interrupt service routine is located from a different address, we should put a jump instruction there. So, that now the system jumps to the processor jumps to that particular location. And so, that is the responsibility of the IVT entry, the interrupt vector table entry. So, normally it is uh, we put a jump instruction there to go to the actual service routine. And the one thing that the service routine should do is that it should enable the uh, interrupts using the EI instruction because as soon as this uh, interrupt occurs the, the the when we go to the interrupt acknowledge cycle this uh, all the interrupt gets disabled okay the INTR gets disabled so it is important that the interrupt service routine it performs on enable interrupt to re-enable the interrupt process otherwise the future interrupts will not be accepted. And at the end of the service routine, the rate instruction should be there and this rate instruction will uh, return the execution to the point where the program was interrupted. So, as we have seen that when in the INTA cycle, when the RST opcode is getting executed, so system saves the return address into the stack and on getting the rate instruction that address is uh, retrieved and that address will be loaded into the program counter so that the processor will return to the instruction. Uh, which which it has uh, the, the instruction just after the one at which the interrupt was received okay so that way it continues so if we just if we uh, look into the process more clearly so i can say that if this is the program at which uh, the interrupt has occurred say when the instruction so this particular instruction was getting executed at that time interrupt has occurred so, the processor uh, will come to uh, this, so one RST code will be generated from the device if this is your if this is the device. So, somehow this device will produce an opcode for uh, RST, opcode for RST N instruction and this will redirect the processor to uh, some address. So, this, 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 so this will redirect if this is the full memory. So, the first part is the IVT internal vector table it will take the processor to a particular location in the IVT and in that location I can have a jump instruction jump 1000 say so that my actual ISR is loaded from 1000 and while it has while this opcode RST is executed the return address that is this address has been saved into the stack. So, this address is saved into the stack. Now, this uh, the from this uh, from jump 1000, so it will start come here. So, one important thing that it should do here is the enable interrupt, otherwise, the interrupts will be disabled. And finally, there should be a rate instruction for return. So, uh, when it gets the rate instruction, then uh, from the stack, this address uh, this address will be retrieved from the stack, and the program counter will be loaded with this so that my control comes back to this point. So, this is the sequence in which uh, this uh, um, interrupt will be executed. Now, uh, so in case of 8085, so there are 8 such uh, restart instructions, the RST instruction that I said. So, there are 8 such instructions named RST 0 through 7. And each of these uh, would send the execution to a particular uh, predetermined hardware memory address. Okay. So, RST 0 is equivalent to call 0000. 0, 0, 0. So, it will send the uh, control to the uh, location 0. Okay. So, as, so, it is same as pressing the reset button, uh, re uh, 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 activating the reset pin of the processor. 
or the, this RST 0. So, it will transfer the control to the location 0 0 0 0. Then RST 1 is 0 0 0 8. So, RST 2 is 0 0 1 0 that is 16 in decimal. So, you see that what is happening is that in general if the instruction is RST n, if the instruction is RST n, so this n is multiplied by 8 and whatever be the value, so the processor will be jumping to that particular address. So, if it is a RST 4, then 4 into 8 is 32, so it will jump to the address 0020 hex. Okay. So, uh, that way at, at that location the interrupt service routine should exist. So, it may be a jump instruction to the actual routine or if the routine is very small as you see that between two successive RST locations, so we have got 8 byte space. So, if my interrupt service routine is very small, then I can hold it in 8 bytes. So, that may be sufficient or if it is not so, then we, we should put a jump instruction and go there. So, next we will have uh, um, this, uh, the sequence is like this. So, restart sequence, it has got three machine cycles. In the first machine cycle, which is known as interrupt acknowledge cycle or INTA cycle. So, the microprocessor sends the INTA signal. So, INTA line is made low and when the INTA is active, the processor will read the data lines and it, it will expect that on the data bus there will be the opcode for a specific RST instruction. As I said corresponding to the device, so uh, we have to map it onto one of these RSTs and then the, that device uh, should put that RST opcode onto the data bus. So this is the first machine cycle or INTA interrupt acknowledge cycle. In the second and third machine cycles what will happen is that the 16 bit address of the next instruction will be saved onto the stack that is the PC high and PC low those two values will be saved onto the stack. And then the processor will jump to the address to which to the uh, uh, of the specified RST instruction. So, this is the whole sequence of operation that is done in the restart sequence. So, this way the processor will be going to the uh, interrupting uh, to the interrupt service routine. Now, the location for the IVT, it may, may not hold the complete service routine as I said. So, the routine may be written somewhere else and we can have a jump instruction at the ISL location uh, to, to, to uh, that may be kept in the IVT block. The inter as we have already said that this interrupt vector table, it may have a jump instruction only for the actual service routine. Now, how to generate uh, this RST opcode? So, that is a challenge. So, apparently it seems that how a device will generate the RST N uh, instruction code. Okay? So, this is very simple in, in the fact that uh, the designers, they have made this RST coding in such a fashion, the, the opcode op design of RST in such a fashion that it is quite easy to generate the uh, RST N opcode. So, we will see how, uh, how is it doing it. So, as we know that opcode is nothing but one 8 bit pattern, that 8 bit pattern has to be generated on the uh, response to the INTA signal. So, this is how we can, we, we see that the RST opcode is generated. Okay? So, for example, suppose we are looking into the RST 5 instruction. So, in the RST instruction opcode, so if you look into the bits, then these bits are fixed like say uh, D7, uh, D6, then uh, the D7, D, D6, then uh, actually this bit number 5, 4 and 3. So, the, the 3, 4 and 5, so they will contain the actual uh, number that uh, the opcode, the uh, n number that we have, the rest of the bits are all 1. So, this is, uh, so 3 bit number 3, 4 and 5, so they are, they will hold the pattern 1, 0, 1 and rest of the bits are all 1. So, you see that we can have a simple device, we can have a simple tri-state buffer like this, where uh, for this particular instruction you see only the bit 4 has to be 0. So, bit 4 is made 0 and all other bits are tied high. Now, in the interrupt acknowledge cycle, this INTA bar line will be activated as a result this tri-state buffers will get uh, enabled and uh, the whatever, so the whatever be the content on this side of the buffer, they will be available here. And you see as a result all the bits excepting D4, they will get 1, only D4 will get a 0. So, that will be treated. So, this D7 to D0, so if it is connected to the data bus line of the processor, then it will be uh, understood as the 
uh, opcode for RST5. So, this uh, so any other RST instruction rest of the bits remain unaltered only these bits bit number 3, 4 and 5. So, they will be uh, changing. Okay. So, RST0 to RST7 these bits will change from 000 to 111. So, that way we can very easily generate the opcode for the RST. So, this is the during interrupt technology machine cycle. The first machine uh, so the microprocessor will first enable the activate the INTA signal. So, this will enable the um, uh, tri state buffers and then uh, the values that will come on the tri state buffer, uh, on the, which the, so that will come onto the data bus. Okay. So, we will place the value onto the data bus and it will come there. So, for the RST5 code, so it is EF, so that is fine. For any other opcode, there are some other, uh, any other RST, some other opcode will come. So, that way this RST5 can be uh, um, there and the RST5 we know that it is equivalent to call 0028 a hex instruction. So, it will branch to the location 0028. Next we answered the question that is how long should the interrupt line remain high. So, this is a very pertinent question because when you are designing a device to be uh, operating with the microprocessor and the device will operate uh, by send by will send interrupt to the processor. So, how long the device should be able to make that interrupt line high so that it will be sensed by the processor. So, as we know, so uh, the microprocessor will check the INTL line one clock cycle before the last T state of each instruction. So, if one instruction will consist of a number of machine cycles. In the last machine cycle, last uh, T state, last clock state, at that point it checks for the uh, interrupt line. So, if this uh, interrupt line becomes deactive before that, then that interrupt will not be sensed by the microprocessor. So, the, because this interrupt process is asynchronous, so it, it, it can occur at any point of time. So, it must remain high enough so that this longest instruction can be executed. And in case of 8085, the longest instruction is the call instruction that takes 18 clock cycles. So, um, uh, so if, if it takes 18 clock cycles and this INTA line is checked on the last uh, clock cycle, so for 17.5 T states, the line, the line must be high. So, you can find out the of frequency of the processor multiplied by 17.5 that will tell you that the minimum duration that for which uh, this interrupt line must be high. So, that we, it, it will guarantee that if the interrupt occurs the processor will definitely have a look into that. Okay. So, this way we this answers the question that how long must the interrupt line remain high. And next question is how long should it remain high? How long can the interrupt remain high? So, can I keep it high uh, conti continually? Okay? So, this question uh, can be answered like this. The interrupt line must be deactivated before the EI instruction is executed. Now, as I said that any interrupt service routine, uh, one of the important job that it does is to, uh, is to put the instruction EI enable interrupt somewhere. And as a standard practice, what is done is that this uh, interrupt enable uh, line is activated just uh, before doing anything uh, uh, very much uh, useful. Okay. So, uh, before going into the actual uh, routine, so this is done. So, any ISR code, so normally what we do is that if this is the beginning of the ISR, then first we push the uh, registers that we have, whatever register this ISR will be using all those registers are pushed and after that we put the EI instruction. So, if somebody uh, thinks that okay, I do not need the register values, then this part is absent. So, EI becomes the first instruction in the interrupt service routine and when that EI is uh, put, so if the EI is executed, all the interrupts get enabled again. So, you can understand now that if I do not deactivate the device, uh, the interrupt pin coming from the device, interrupt signal coming from the device before this EI instruction is executed, then so it will be taken as a second interrupt. So, processor may take uh, that uh, interrupt line as the second interrupt. So, so, in the worst case, this is the situation that EI can be the first instruction of the ISR and once the microprocessor starts to uh, respond to the INTR interrupt, INTA becomes active. So, this becomes INTA becomes active and then EI uh, also gets active. So, 
uh, the, the another interrupt will be taken. So, it is a standard practice that interrupt should be turned off as soon as the INTA signal is received. So, whenever the device receives the INTA signal from the processor, it should turn off the um, uh, interrupt line. So, that should be the practice to be followed. Now, coming to the um, uh, other issues uh, regarding a INTR interrupt, uh, can the microprocessor be interrupted again before completion of the ISR? So, uh, that is once uh, the interrupt has occurred, so the, uh, the processor is executing the ISR, can it be interrupted again before finishing the interrupt? Now, the answer is yes and no simultaneously and it depends on the user because uh, you can see that uh, uh, you can, you, you can uh, once the interrupt has occurred, uh, uh, the, uh, the INTR will be disabled and it will be enabled only after the EI instruction has been put. So, whenever the user feels that now I am ready to accept the next interrupt should put the EI instruction. So, if the, if the user thinks that no, no, no interrupt should be coming now once I am in the ISR, then EI should be at the end of the ISR. And if the user thinks that okay, after at the from the very beginning I am going to accept uh, next interrupt, then that EI should be at the beginning of the of the ISR. So this way, so as soon as the first interrupt arrives, all maskable interrupts are disabled. So this is the this is done by the processor, and they are enabled by executing the EI instruction. So now where do you put the EI instruction? Is the uh, user's job. So the if the EI instruction is placed early in the ISR other interrupt may occur before the ISR is done. So, that is the thing. Okay. So, at the point at which you are ready to receive the next interrupt, so you can put the EI there. Next, we answer the question that multiple interrupts and priorities, like how do I have priorities, like uh, so I have so far whatever I have talked about, so I have got a single interrupt line and a single device connected to the uh, processor. Now, how can I ensure that a number of devices uh, may be connected uh, to the uh, processor using the INTR line alone and there will be priorities among the devices. For, for example, there may be say 8 devices connected to, uh, with the microprocessor through the INTR line and um, there will be priorities. So, the, the devices device 1 may have the highest priority followed by device 2, device 3 like that. So, device lower priority uh, inter lower priority pr devices, so they will be allowed to interrupt the processor only if the higher priority devices they have not interrupted the processor. So, typical design is like this that I have got uh, all these uh, interrupt lines uh, coming from different processors, put them into this uh, OR gate sort of thing and then give it to the microprocessors INTR pin. But if we do this, then the problem is that all these uh, lines, they are of equal priority. So, any of the interrupt coming, so it will be interrupting the processor. So, that we may not want. So, we may want that when this interrupt, uh, this device has interrupted, so none of the remaining ones would be allowed to interrupt. Similarly, the second one will be allowed to interrupt only if the first one has not generated any interrupt. So, this is how this can be done. So, that we will uh, look now. So, the microprocessor can only respond to one signal on the INTR line. So, we must allow the signal from only one device to reach the microprocessor. So, there must be some priority assignment for that purpose. So, how to do this? So, for that purpose there is a special uh, chip which is uh, known as priority encoder or chip number is 74366. This particular circuit it has got 8 inputs and 3 outputs. Okay. The inputs are, uh, they are the, this is actually a priority encoder. So, a number of devices may be connected to this uh, uh, chip. So, the 8 devices can be connected to this chip and um, the pin to which the device is connected will decide its priority. So, input 7 has the highest priority, input 0 has the lowest priority and these 3 outputs they will carry the index of the highest priority active input. So, uh, I think there is a diagram. So, in this diagram, so you see that uh, 74138, so this is, so this is the uh, priority encoder that we have. So, this uh, device, so this device, so this is actually uh, going to, uh, the, this is the priority encoder. So, these interrupt lines are coming from uh, 
uh, there so it is this i0 to i7 so these are the interrupt lines connected here now uh, this one uh, uh, this uh, there, there so there is a uh, we can put this uh, three output lines so eight input three output and these three output lines so they can be put through some tri state buffer and now you see that uh, if um, say this uh, this encoder will ensure that if i7 has occurred so here you will get the pattern 111 if i6 has occurred and i7 has not occurred then only you will get the pattern 110 here so that way whichever uh, whichever highest priority interrupt has occurred so that value that index will be available in these three bits so this zero will be available here only if uh, uh, the none of the interrupts from uh, device 1 to device 7 has occurred so only device zero has interrupted so in that case you will get the pattern 000 here so uh, the, this uh, priority encoder it has got an interrupt line so that is connected to the interrupt line of the processor and in the interrupt acknowledge cycle uh, so you see that uh, this interrupt acknowledge cycle so this will enable this tri state buffer so that these three bits will be available here and uh, they are the, so this uh, uh, for the rst instruction you know that these other bits so they are all one this is bit excepting this bit number 3 4 and 5 which can vary depending upon that RST n, that co value of n. So, rest of the bits are all one. So, that is done by this circuit tying all other bits to one. So, in the when the interrupt acknowledgement and acknowledge cycle is entered I and, and the processor uh, enables this INTA bar line. So, this tri state buffer gets activated and all this uh, uh, n the RST n that n value will be available here. As a result, the processor will see one RST n instruction into this buffer and it will go to the uh, it, it will go to the corresponding interrupt service routine now to uh, send that uh, interrupt acknowledge uh, line to the individual devices so what is done one decoder is in, uh, employed here 74138 decoder so here these three bits are connected uh, uh, these three bits uh, from this tri state buffer so they are connected here and whichever device has been allowed whichever device has been allowed to interrupt uh, the system the highest priority device so that number is fed here accordingly the corresponding output will be enabled and that will go to the interrupt uh, acknowledge for the device for example if say device 6 has interrupted so here you will get the pattern 110 and that 110 being fed here will enable this o6 line and o6 line will send the inta signal to the device 6 others will not even if uh, say 5 6 5 4 3 all of them have interrupted only device 6 will get the interrupt acknowledge not the others ok so this way we can handle this multiple interrupts and their priorities so opcodes uh, from different rst instructions they follow a pattern bit uh, d5 d4 and d3 uh, they are uh, they are they are having the opcode so that uh, they, these bits will change and then that will give the code for RST and 111 is RST 7 and uh, 000 is RST 0 other bits are always 1. So, this way we can use this uh, decode uh, this priority encoder for generating the RST code. Now, the problem that we have is that uh, the only way to change the priority of the devices is the is to change the order of connecting the hardware. So, uh, you cannot change that dynamically. So, like if you want to change the priority between device 6 and device 7, you want to make device 6 higher priority and device 7 lower priority, but in that case I have to connect device 6 to i7 and device 7 to i6. So, physically I have to change the order, but still for uh, small systems, so this is fine. So, it, 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 uh, up to 8 devices, so we can have this priority encoding. So, if you have got more number of devices, then possibly we can have, we can think about a multi-level uh, priority encoder scheme by which we can uh, connect more than one 74366 chips and uh, resolve uh, uh, interrupt priorities that way. So, this uh, on the other hand this maskable or vectored interrupt, so there are four uh, uh, masked or vectored interrupts in 8085. They are known as 5.5, 6 uh, 7.5, they are RST 5.5, 6.5, 7.5. And there is another trap instruction which is the trap interrupt which is now we will come we will see later. So, all of them are maskable. So, so first of all this maskable uh, interrupts uh, 
R3, 5.5, 6.5 and 7.5, they are maskable interrupt. The other interrupt that I have mentioned, trap, is a non-maskable interrupt and they are automatically vectored. So, RST 5.5, the vector address is 002C, 6.5, it is 0034 and 7.5 is 003C. So, when this interrupt uh, occurs, then the processor will jump to the location 002C, then uh, when 6.5 occurs, it will go to 0034. So, you see that addresses that the 002C is between RST 5 and RST 6, it is at the halfway between the two addresses for corresponding to RST 5 and 6, that is why it is called RST 5.5. Similarly, RST 6.5 is midway between RST uh, 6 and RST 7, those two addresses. So, that is why it is 6.5 and 7.5 is uh, the, um, after 7, so 4 bytes away from 7, so that way it is uh, 7.5. So, that is why it is a halfway between the two, so it has got the name like that. 